Sanchez, professor of piano at Texas A&M University Commerce, and I am greeting you from my home in Rockwell, Texas, to share with you my presentation on the piano music of Carlos Guastavino. I want to specially thank MTNA for giving us the opportunity to share our work with all of you as we navigate through a different way of living. I hope you enjoy the music of Carlos Guastavino as much as I do, and thanks for watching. The piano compositions by Argentine composers are a significant contribution to piano literature. They represent the voice of a nation that has enjoyed a strong musical tradition with noted European influence and unique fusion of Argentine folk dances and songs. As a result of this synthesis of styles, these works by Argentine composers possess distinctive qualities and an incomparable sound. Few composers like Alberto Ginestera and Astor Piazzolla have reached international recognition. Many other talented musicians remain to be discovered. One of these composers is Carlos Guastavino. Some of you may be familiar with some of his art songs, others may recognize some of his choral or chamber works, but unfortunately, his works for piano still await their deserved recognition outside of Argentina. His piano output includes short character pieces such as Bailecito and Gato, which demonstrate the influence of Argentine folk music. But his most important piano works also include his sonata in C sharp minor, the Diez Cantilenas Argentinas, and the Three Sonatinas. He also contributed to the piano pedagogy field with his set of ten pieces, Mis Amigos, which means My Friends. As we will see, some may consider Guastavino's compositional style was old-fashioned, since he adhered strongly to a tonal language at a time when most composers were exploring the twelve-tone method and atonalism. Despite the criticism, Guastavino enjoyed the approval of audiences and his music has survived the test of time. It is my strong desire that by the end of our time together in this presentation, you will have discovered new works and that you will feel curious and inspired to add the works of Guastavino to your teaching and performing repertoire. Who was Carlos Guastavino? Carlos Vicente Guastavino was born on April 5, 1912, in Santa Fe, the province of Santa Fe, in Argentina. His parents were Italian immigrants who were active amateur musicians and played the guitar or the mandolin. Other members of the Guastavino family were also musicians. For example, his older brother, José Amadeo, played the piano, and his uncle Pedro played the clarinet and sang. All this early exposure to music making would remain in Carlos Guastavino's memories for many years. At the age of four, in 1916, he began his piano studies with Esperanza Lothringer, who was born in 1887 and died in 1960. She was originally from Santa Fe and had a prominent career as a pedagogue and composer, active through the first few decades of the 20th century. Of his beginnings and musical studies, Westavino remembers, and I quote, I do not know how I got started. There was a piano at home. I do not even know why we had a piano, because my family was not rich. But there was a piano at home. Someone sat me at the piano and I started to play. My father sent me to take lessons with Esperanza Lothringer, who had just returned from Germany. She had studied in Germany. She was a young woman of 20, 25 years of age, and I do not know what they did, but they taught me how to play the piano. At age four, I was playing a sonata by Mozart, K545. I also remember I used to go to a teacher's house where I played games and I also played the piano. These were all teachers that were born to teach. They taught me how to do it. End of quote. In 1917, he performed for the first time in a concert at the Teatro Municipal de Santa Fe, a piece for violin and piano composed by Esperanza Lothringer for Carlos Guastavino. 
the local newspaper announced, Tonight, Carlitos Westavino will play in the concert of the Academia Lodringer. He has an extraordinary talent for his age. Unfortunately, his teacher moved the following year and Guastavino received no formal training for the next several years. Between 1918 and 1924, he attended the Jesuit school Immaculada Concepción de Santa Fe, where he furthered his musical experience by participating in the choir and serving as church pianist and organist. He remembers, and I quote, I was in the choir at school and we sang Ave Marias and other pieces like that. The director played the organ and then I started playing the organ and improvising. I do not know really what I did, but I must have done it well because as a kid I would sub for the director for the 9 a.m. mass. That is how I learned how to play the organ and even use the pedals. At, the age, uh, at that age you just learn everything. End of quote. Upon his high school graduation in 1929 with prizes in chemistry, mining, and geology, and honorable mention in physics, he attended the Universidad Nacional del Litoral and pursued a degree in chemical engineering. However, parallel to his studies at the university, he continued to study music and make numerous presentations in concerts in his home city of Santa Fe, as well as the neighboring city of Paraná. In August 1937, and as a recipient of a scholarship from the Ministry of Education of Santa Fe, he relocated to Buenos Aires, the capital city of Argentina, where there were more opportunities available to him to further his musical education. As a student at the National Conservatory of Music, he reunited with his teacher from his childhood, Esperanza Lothringer, and continued to study piano with her along with his studies in harmony, counterpoint, and orchestration with Atos Palma, a renowned teacher of the time. With a growing popularity and an increasing number of awards, in particular for his songs and uh, other works, he focused his energy on composition and the performance of his works throughout Argentina and other countries in South America like Chile, Brazil, and Uruguay. In 1942, he premiered at the Teatro de On of Buenos Aires his timeless and famous song, La Rosa y el Sauce, with American baritone Aubrey Penke. His songs, in particular this one, attracted the attention of international stars like Marian Anderson and Victoria de los Angeles. A few years later, in July 1945, the Czech pianist Rudolf Firkusny presented four recitals at the Cologne Theatre of Buenos Aires and premiered his sonatina in G minor. He also met the Spanish composer Manuel de Falla in Alta Gracia, Córdoba, at his residence, Los Espinillos. Incidentally, Manuel de Falla moved to Argentina in 1938 and died in 1946 at his residence in Argentina, which today is home to the Museo Manuel de Falla. Let's listen to the opening of the first movement of the Sonatina in G minor.
1947 was a great year for Guastavino. He gained a strong international fame in Europe and the United States, and he embarked on a tour that took him to Italy, England, Belgium, Switzerland, Portugal, Spain, and France. More and more musicians of international caliber started performing his works more frequently. He combined his busy schedule traveling around the world with a new position as assistant director to the Escuela Superior de Música y Canto of the Universidad Nacional del Litoral. And later, he received a scholarship from the British Council in the United Kingdom and was engaged in academic activities at the Royal Academy of Music in London and performed at Wigmore Hall in December 1948. The BBC, under the direction of Walter Gerr, premiered his Tres Romances Argentinos, which he transcribed to orchestra during his time in the UK and was later recorded by the BBC Orchestra. This work, Tres Romances Argentinos, had been premiered in Buenos Aires and was originally written for two pianos. It was dedicated to Isabel and Amalia Cavallini and was premiered at the Teatro Odeon. In the 1950s, more international figures became more and more interested in performing his works. In addition to the aforementioned Marian Anderson and Rudolf Firkusny, we have pianists like Wilhelm Backhaus and Walter Gisekin performing his works now. In 1954, his Concerto for Piano and Orchestra, Romance de Santa Fe, was premiered with him at the piano. And two years later, he embarked on a tour of Russia with a concert at the Bolshoi Theater, a concert that was attended by Kavalevsky. He also went to China and the Czech Republic. He wrote a letter to the director of Ricordia Americana Publishing Company at the time he was in China. He said that there was such an interest for his songs and they were being translated and people were very interested in purchasing copies of his music. In the late 1950s, he made several recordings for RCA Victor and engaged in teaching positions including the National Conservatory of Music and the Municipal Conservatory. He continued his teaching career until his retirement in 1973. In these years, and after the death of his mother, he lived in solitude and abandoned composition almost completely, and lived quite an introspective life. He enjoyed further recognitions for his work as a composer, including awards by the Organization from the American States in 1987 and from the Argentine government in 1999. As a result of his decline in health, his family took him back to his birthplace in 1997, where he died on October 20, 2000, and is buried at San José del Rincón Cemetery. I would like to now focus my attention on Carlos Guastavino's contributions to the world of piano pedagogy. There are numerous presents of works or collections of works that have been written with the goal of combining the development of technical skill along with the growth of musical taste and expression. Some of the most common examples include the Anna Magdalena Bach notebook, the albums for the young, such as those by Tchaikovsky and Schumann, or the pieces by Kavalevsky. Towards the end of the 19th century, there were numerous examples of works written by Argentine composers that continued the European tradition of creating compositions suitable for students to further their studies of the instrument. Some examples include Julián Aguirre's Cinco Tristes, the over 70 works by Alberto Williams in the collection Series de Piezas para Niños, into the 20th century, we encountered Luis Cheneos and his Siete Piezas Infantiles, and of course, the celebrated Alberto Ginastera, who wrote the Doce Preludios Americanos, Opus 12, in 1944. Guastavino wrote three sets of pieces, Mis Amigos, My Friends, Musical Portraits for Young Pianists, which was published in 1966. Diez Preludios, Ten Preludes, which are based on popular children's rhymes from Argentina and was published in 1952. And we also have Diez Cantos Populares, Ten Popular Songs, published in 1974. These works share similar characteristics. They tend to be short 
and more accessible, although some of them are more suitable for an upper intermediate or early advanced student. They also have inviting harmonies and melodies that share an Argentinian flavor. Westavino is right at home with these miniatures, making them highly melodic. They resemble songs without words that perfectly blend their pedagogical value with his unique Argentine voice. To navigate through these pieces, I would like to focus on four different elements or characteristics that make them pedagogically and musically appealing. Form and harmony, rhythm and melody, texture, and expressivity and musical elements. Let's first look at form and harmony. Form is an important aspect of all pieces that claim pedagogical value. Shorter and concise works are more suitable stepping stones in the musical and intellectual development of a student. Most of these pieces abide by this and are cast in either binary or ternary form with some subtle harmonic or melodic changes in the repeated sections. We could spend quite a bit of time discussing Guastavino's harmonic language, but for the time being, let's focus on some of the elements present in these three sets of pieces. As expected in teaching pieces, the composer favors keys and key signatures that are of easier access. Twelve of these 30 pieces have either one sharp or one flat, and many are in the minor mode which serve as the perfect vehicle to communicate their evocative character. The first piece we will look at comes from Cantos Populares, and it is number one. This piece shows interesting chromaticism, sudden and unexpected modulations, and demonstrates the ease with which Westavino navigates from the major to the minor mode, something that reminds us of Schubert in many ways. No wonder, oftentimes, Westavino is referred to as the Schubert of the Pampas not just because of these harmonic characteristics, but rather for his cantabile melodies and numerous songs for voice and piano. In the key of F minor, Guastavino seems determined to avoid a perfect authentic cadence. The varied rhythm with polyrhythms and syncopations heightened the melodic chromaticism and its expressivity. In the excerpt, excerpt I will play, you will recognize a sudden modulation in measure 13 and then a colorful cadence in the parallel major, F major. This is the A section of Cantos Populares number one. The next example comes from the collection Mis Amigos, My Friends, and it is number eight, entitled Cassandra de la Calle Galileo. Every piece in this collection of ten miniatures receives the name of a friend of Guastavino and the street where they lived. In this example, we see the unique ambiguity created by the use of the Phrygian mode. Notice the repeated use of an F natural in this excerpt.
Here we have another example from the same collection, Mis Amigos, and this is number three, Ismael de la Calle Teodoro Garcia. In this case, we see a hint of the Dorian mode and the harmonization of melodies in sixths and thirds, giving them a warm, rich color. Fermina de la Calle Aranguren is the fifth piece in the collection Mis Amigos and was the very first piece of Guastavino I learned. Here we see the ABAB form with subtle harmonic differences in the repeat of the material. Whereas the A theme shows the use of the Aeolian mode, that's the natural minor, we can also hear the use of the Mixolydian mode when the B theme returns at the end of the piece. This is an absolutely enchanting piece and I hope you will enjoy it. Let's now focus on some rhythmic and melodic characteristics. One compositional device found in several pieces of these sets is the use of rhythmic ostinatos. As a matter of fact, each of the ten preludes use a different rhythmic figure. We will look at the second prelude, La Flor de Caña, the cane flower. The music is marked Adagio Molto Cantabile and the melody is propelled forward through the ostinato rhythm that permeates the entire composition.
Going back to the set, mis amigos, let's look at number four, Pablo del Aero Parque. Of course, the title does not mean that Guastavino's friend Pablo lived at the airport, but in this case, the title is referring to a particular area in the city of Buenos Aires, which is neighboring the airport. This drive in peace with its cheerful char character is quite challenging and more suitable for a more advanced student. Here again, Guastavino uses rhythmic ostinato both in the accompanying and in the melodic line. and double subdivision of the beat is a rhythmic characteristic found in several Argentine folk dances. Where, whereas it creates interesting combination of rhythmic elements, it can be challenging to some students. Suitable for an upper intermediate or early advanced student, this sixth piece of Mis Amigos, Gabriel de la Calle Antonaegui, is written in 4-4, but you can clearly see the triplet and double subdivision of the beat is used throughout. Additionally, there are some voicing uh, issues that would need to be addressed to bring out with clarity the active texture of this piece. This next example shows characteristics of two different Argentine dances, the gato and the samba. We will explore these two dances in detail in just a moment, but in the meantime, we can look at how the music of this piece from Mis Amigos, number 10, Alina de la Calle La Croce, has an alternating uh, use of 6, 8 and 3, 4, giving it a very exotic feel. Let's look at the milonga from Cantos Populares. This is the no number four. This piece shows the accompaniment of milonga campera, dotted eighth note followed by sixteenth note and two eighth notes. The rhythm resembles that of the habanera. It was part of the musical expression of the peasants in suburban Argentina, in the region of La Pampa, a very vast area where agriculture has been the primary activity. Initially, it was only sung with the usual accompaniment of the guitar, but then it incorporated a choreography 
that is slower than the urban or city milonga. This is cast in ABA form and in the key of G minor, with the middle section harmonized in thirds and in the parallel major, whereas the left hand is always engaged in bringing forth the characteristic rhythm of the milonga, the right hand, with its singing line, evokes vividly the nostalgic characteristics of this music. I invite you to listen to Cantos Populares number 4. So far we have seen a lot of melody plus accompaniment in these pieces. We also saw a preference for harmonizing melodies in thirds and sixths. But oftentimes the texture used by Guastavino can be more independent and active, with an increasing use of intricate counterpoint and imitation. There is even contrapunt and writing in his set of preludes. As a matter of fact, prelude number 8, Un Domingo de Mañana, a Sunday morning, is a three-voice fugue. As you can see in this musical example, the exposition of the fugue presents all the expected techniques and characteristics found in this type of composition. It is difficult to isolate the expressive and musical elements, so throughout my discussion so far I have made reference to the fact that Guastavino shows a language that is strongly rooted in the Romantic tradition. This means that the use of rubato and legato is inherent in the style in order to bring out the richness of the sound and expression. I would like to conclude this portion of my presentation with an excerpt from Cantos Populares number 6. <laughs> Thank you. 
Let's now move on to the Diez Cantilenas Argentinas. Earlier, I made reference to Guastavino's predilection for short pieces. We can add to that his preference to the minor keys, as a large majority of his output is in a minor key. The Diez Cantilenas is a series of works that were conceived between 1956 and 1958, and he later grouped together for publication. These works can be recognized as very characteristics of the composer. They remained very dear to him. Each piece bears a title that makes reference to a place or a person, and their lyrical nature can categorize them as songs without words. Westavino's skillful writing for the piano reveals his command for the instrument as he explores the melodic richness and contrapuntal intricacies the piano can do so well. Harmonically, the composer enhances the tonal language he employs with carefully crafted dissonances that are always directly relevant to the expression of the music. In the late 1950s, Westavino produced a recording for RCA Records of several pieces. Among these recordings, we find his Ten Cantilenas. Let's listen to an excerpt from Cantilenas No. 5, Abelarda Olomos, performed by Carlos Guastavino.
We have reached now the final portion of my presentation. Throughout his life, Carlos Guastavino drew elements from Argentine typical dances. In the following works, we recognize the vivid presence of the dances such as Samba, Gato, and Bailecito. I would like to spend some time exploring major characteristics of these dances before we evaluate their presence in the works that concern us today. Let's begin with the Samba. Many sources indicate that this dance dates from 1849, although it is presumed that the Samba is even much older. Some other sources even date it as early as 1812. Most agree that it is probably derived from the Peruvian Samba Cueca, which was a dance practiced in most regions around the Andes. The samba features couples outlining a simple choreography that includes circling around and working, walking, always holding a handkerchief in their hands. The male dancer always seems to pursue the partner, who at first seems resistant, but by the end of the dance they consent. The music usually includes an eight-measure introduction, although this can sometimes be omitted. The phrases are usually four measure long, and the melodies are mostly bimodal. The mixture between major and minor gives the samba a touch of nostalgia, which is one of its most distinctive features. Written in 6-8, the rhythmic structure of this dance presents a combination of triple and double meter. Guitars provide the harmonic accompaniment, and drums the rhythmic. Some sambas are purely instrumental where many others have lyrics and are sung. Arden mis labios por ti, muriéndome de amor, porque eres mi dueña, santiagueña de mi corazón. Porque eres mi dueña, santiagueña. Mis ojos sobre tu pelo. The second movement of the three sonatinas is entitled Retama, and it serves as a great example of the samba. Cast in sonata form, the music is written in 6-8 and in the key of E minor. The music begins with two introductory measures that lead to the first theme, measures 3 to 16. Notice how the melody is harmonized in thirds and triads. The left hand accompanying figure resembles the strumming of a guitar. Measures 17 to 29 serve as a transition and modulation to B major. The second theme arrives on measure 29 and extends to measure 40. Here we can hear in the new key a combination of rhythmic patterns that alternate between triple and double subdivision of the beat, which is, as we saw earlier, a characteristic of this dance. You can always uh, identify this rhythmic figure in the left hand as if it was imitating a drum. You will hear now the exposition of Retama from Three Sonatinas. Thank you. 
Next, we have the gato. The gato is a fast dance that was practiced almost in the entire country, even though in some areas it was known by the name of Balecito, in La Rioja, San Juan, Mendoza, and San Luis, the western region of the country. Earliest references to this dance date to 1820, and it was one of the preferred dances of the workers in rural areas. This dance features some interesting rhythmic elements. The music is typically written in 6-8, however, alternation or just a position of 6-8 and 3-4 are rhythmic characteristics of this dance. As in most other dances, the guitar provides not only the harmonic accompaniment, but also the rhythmic. Just like the samba, this dance, feature, this dance features couples that are not holding each other in their choreography. Instead, they freely interact, moving in circles, away and towards each other. This dance can also include footwork, as the female and male dancers take turns in the choreography. Guastavino's Gato presents symmetrical phrases in four or eight measures. The characteristic rhythmic energy of the dance is reflected with the frequent tempo changes, especially at the beginning of new sections. The music is written in three stops to facilitate the layout of the different layers of the texture. Harmonically, as it is expected in this dance, is very functional, one, four, and five, but is enriched by the use of dissonances and clusters. In the middle section of the dance, the melody is harmonized in thirds, which is also characteristic of many folk dances from Argentina. The bailecito is a typical dance originated in the northwestern region of Argentina. The couple dances without holding each other and perform a choreography that features simple steps and the use of a handkerchief. The instrumental ensemble usually includes the guitar and drum along with a melodic instrument. Guastavino's bailecito is loyal to the characteristics of this Argentine dance. The couple dance features foot stomping, handkerchief waving, and other circular movements. Let's watch a clip that shows us a typical choreography of this dance.
see, the phrase structure is very regular in four measure phrases. It is in the key of C sharp minor and the tonal layout is very traditional. The writing is in three staffs, with the principal melody in the higher register and a secondary line, more chromatic, in the middle register. The bass is providing the rhythmic accompaniment. Rhythmically, this work is a fascinating study. His use of hemiola and syncopation and the combination of 3-4 and 6-8 that I mentioned earlier make this piece very unique and engaging. I will conclude my presentation today with a performance of Guastavino's Bailecito. 